Hi, everyone. Welcome to the State of Retail with Michael LeBlanc. We're so excited to have him with us today. I'll introduce myself first. I'm Nicole Hilton, the Chief Marketing Officer at the Canadian Gift Association. And of course, we have Michael, who has 25 plus years experience working with brands, retail, marketing, and e-commerce. He is currently the Senior Advisor at the Retail Council of Canada and the host of Canada's number one industry podcast, The Voice of Retail. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. One quick reminder is that you have a question chat box on the side of your dashboard. So if you have a question for Michael at any point during this, this presentation, please type it in. Um, we'll be checking in midway just to see if any questions have come up, but we'll mainly be holding questions till the end. Thanks for being with us today and over to Michael. Nicole, thanks so much for, uh, for having me. Good uh, afternoon or good morning for those on the West Coast. Uh, it's great to be here today. We're gonna talk about retail. I'm gonna try to unpack what's been going on in retail, both uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID. And Nicole, I think we've got four or five hours booked. Just kidding. Uh, we are gonna get it in to about 45-ish uh, minutes and then we'll leave lots of time for questions. Uh, so please, um, you know, please uh, be, be uh, free and, and open with your questions and I'll try and answer whatever I can. So we're gonna go on a bit of a journey today. Um, and what I wanted to do is start with some basic stuff just to kind of anchor us in uh, to retail. So, you know, how big is the retail industry? It's, it's not a bad idea to pause sometimes and recognize the size and enormity. It is the number one employer, private sector employer in the country, 376 plus billion dollars. That's a 2018 number. It's a little one or 2% higher for 2019. We'll see what it looks like in 2020. Um, it is a massive industry, very influential industry. Uh, and as we've come to know, uh, you know, vital industry. It is. It has become an essential industry to keep uh, Canadians fed, clothed, and uh, and sane uh, during the COVID crisis. And um, you know, I, I I made a living out of uh, traveling the world over the past couple of years, telling people that there, there was no retail apocalypse. Uh, I may change that a little bit uh, in the post or in the COVID era, but the reality was. And it's a good place to start our day today. What are the trends? What was happening pre-COVID? Listen, that was only 10, 12 weeks ago. Seems like a long time ago, but I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about, about what were the broad trends in retail. And for the sake of today, I, you know, what is modern retail on a page? You know, really what we were seeing overall was a, a bifurcation or a separation along two axes. Either you are value, convenience, or you are luxury. You were either experience or you were efficiency. And we can all name the different retailers who plot themselves on that curve, right? You are a, a luxury experience retailer like a, like a Canada Goose. You are a highly efficient uh, retailer that plays in the value space. Uh, to some degree, that's an Amazon, certainly on the, on the efficiency. Uh, that could be a giant tiger. So many retailers were trying to plot themselves along this and there was less and less room in the middle. Uh, so, you know, what uh, my friend Steve Dennis, who's got a great book out, by the way, Remarkable Retail, uh, often says is you need to be remarkable in some way, shape or form. It is too competitive. The industry is changing too much. And if you find yourself in the middle of all these without a clear path or clear brand or clear articulation of what you are, uh, then there's a bit of trouble. Just like, you know, standing in the middle of the road, you can be on the left or the right. You're safe uh, in the middle of the road. Uh, there's there can be some problems. And I think we're starting to see that today. And I don't think this trend is going away. I think it's been uh, accelerated. And so, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this and many other things. But as a foundation, um, this was one of the keys. You know, what are the drivers of this change? What are the drivers of changing retail? There's many of them, but to distill them down, you know, the digital retail effect, also known, some folks have called it the Amazon effect, but it's much, much broader than the Amazon effect, much broader than one retailer. But Amazon certainly is the epitome of, of this digital retail effect, but it really resonates around all you know when you look at retail sales in canada uh for year over year and in the us and canada retail sales for 2020 again pre-covid were scheduled to go up at low single digits retail council of canada again I, as nicole mentioned i'm a senior retail advisor there uh, we had forecasted one or two percent growth i'd issued a report called flat is the new up uh for 2020 um but e-commerce sales were growing double digit uh, and that is certainly accelerated now, but it was happening already. There is a channel shift. It's 
So the overall retail industry wasn't growing in any tremendous way. The U.S. industry was growing much more at four, four and a half percent, which is huge for their industry. But there was a significant channel shift happening. And again, we'll talk more about that. There was five intersecting forces of digital transformation that were just transforming retailers. I'm going to focus on that a little bit in the next couple of slides. The sharing, subscription, and rental economies, Gen Z, millennials, you know, they were reconfiguring how retail was done. The apparel retail sector particularly was, was undergoing tremendous changes in the sharing, subscription economy, rental economy. You know, some were saying that, that the rental and, and resell uh, of apparel was going to be bigger than fast fashion, which was the last giant wave of change that hit uh, certainly the fashion. And these were all predicted to be happening. Sustainability, green, the new black. You know, we saw this in many, many ways. Uh, you see it in all factors of, of business. Uh, you know, when you think about food service and restaurant, it's, it's the world on your plate. When you think about uh, retail, it's, it's uh, focusing on sustainability, how the products are sourced. You think about the bags that they are delivered in. You think again in fashion about, you know, this large uh, concern about how much fashion was around. Um, you know, then you've got the rise of integrated, always on technology, billions of IoT, internet only, uh, devices, uh, always on devices. These things were powerful changing drivers. Yeah, let's let's focus on the digital retail effect briefly. You know, consumers are just being rewired. Their expectations are being rewired. This is somewhat generation, generational. If you think about uh, Gen Z grew up online, digital first. Their expectations were being set by their experience online, this frictionless experience. Listen, if the website doesn't load in a few minutes, I'm gone. If I don't check out easily, I'm gone. And they were translating that into the physical experience. Um, so you saw all kinds of crossovers to that, all kinds of different industries, you know, stores were adjusting to become quick delivery areas. You were seeing massive changes in stores. The, the image here is, is a fast checkout at a Walmart uh, in Toronto where you just scan items and go kind of like the Amazon, you know, shop it like you stole it, go sites or go stores that they launched. And then these, these five dramatic changes of, uh, from a digital transformation perspective, they're not actually discrete changes. They're all actually working together to change what modern retail looks like. And I think these are going to be accelerated as well. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, they all come together in videos such as this, where you have uh, smart camera, AI driven machine vision learning cameras that can profile people walking into physical stores, uh, can gen, you know, they can generate mood from facial expressions. They can tell you uh, dwell times, you know, if, if merchandising and retail was the art and science, uh, the science was certainly taking a, a, a big step forward. I'm starting to see, for example, these being uh, adapted to temperature checks, which are early days uh, as folks taking temperatures at the beginning of store uh, is fraught with issues. Uh, TNT, for example, just stopped doing that. TNT Grocer was one of the first Canadian retailers to be doing temperature checks, but stopped because they discovered it as people waited out line on a hot day that their temperature went up to a lot of false positives. Anyway, lots of this technology going on. This is a busy chart and, and I put a reference in there to where you can find it, but I wanted to touch on something about shopping centers. Uh, and again, you know, this shopping center, to, to talk about what has happened in shopping centers, many would say, you know, there's a, the shopping centers are in trouble, they're closing down. In fact, in Canada, for the top 30 shopping malls, notwithstanding a few, uh, business was up, productivity was up, not down. And you can see Yorkdale at the top as, as one of the most product, productive malls in North America, number two or three in North America, huge traffic. Uh, so the malls were still prominent. The ones that have the red uh, often had some anchors move out, a Sears or whoever, um, but generally malls still had a big place in our lives. Uh, so you know that talks about consumer trends. So while e-commerce in Canada pre-COVID was about 8% of core retail, you'll hear different numbers from different people. But if you just look at what core retail is, you know, take out automotive, take out gasoline, uh, it was about 8%. We're not quite sure where it is today. My bet would be it's closer to 15% today. And we're going to talk about that a little later. All right. So let's talk about COVID. Eight to 10 weeks ago, uh, you know, we, we were all transfixed or transformed. Our lives were transformed. And we started to see this. I certainly started to see this as I was talking to retailers coast to coast. Initially in January and February, uh, they were concerned about supply chain issues. Uh, primarily, they were concerned about supply chain issues coming out of, of China. Uh, a little bit concerned about how tourism would be affected with the Chinese customer making such an important part, particularly on the West Coast, uh, the cruise industry that docks in you know, either the West or the East Coast. 
um, some sense of that. But of course, we we didn't imagine. I called it, uh, you know, COVID was going to cast a shadow uh, on retail in 2020. I had no idea it, would get, it was going to be a full eclipse of the sun. Uh, so let's get into that a little bit. What is the reality? You know, when I talked to retailers uh, literally a couple of weeks ago, uh, and when you look at the numbers from Statistics Canada, the year kind of was starting to un uh, unfold as we predicted, uh, that the March to May uh, kind of numbers uh, were starting up actually a little higher than we thought. Uh, if you look at core retail uh, in the month of March, or sorry, in the month of February, it's 2.3%. In the month of March, actually, core retail went up uh, a little bit, uh, which may be a surprise to some of you, went up 2%. Uh, because, you know, you did have two weeks of sales and things were actually going uh, pretty well, actually, in many sectors uh, in uh, in March until, you know, we had this giant circuit breaker uh, thrown and uh, and everything kind of ground to a halt. Uh, you know, listen, in March, um, it depends on the kind of retailer you were. It either hit you like a shockwave or a sledgehammer. So if you were, so to speak, essential, uh, that was always grocery, always pharma, but also depending on which province you were in, could have been hardware, could have been different formats. Um, and if you are essential, the shockwave of demand, uh, sudden demand, we're going to talk about that, that, whether it's panic buying, pantry loading, changes of behavior, uh, you know, the grocers were hit with uh, such increases of demand as restaurants and food service started to shut down and we all transferred our food consumption uh, to the home. And, and for many Canadians, uh, we had a glimpse of what food insecurity could look like. And that was very disconcerting for us. Uh, and we saw other products that were suddenly you counted on, we didn't think much twice about, classic being toilet paper. Um, you know, suddenly we're, we're all buying a lot of toilet paper uh, and it was hard to find. So these, this shockwave of demand and the reverberations throughout the supply chain. If you are non-essential, uh, that's a sledgehammer, uh, particularly if you're non-essential based, uh, based in malls and malls remain closed in most places, they're starting to open up in Quebec, um, but they remain closed. And, and as these things evolved, uh, whether it was a curbside pickup or e-commerce, um, you know, those who are heavily mall-based without an exterior-facing presence uh, were really stuck and really had to determine uh, how they were going to continue. And you can see this chart provided by Statistics Canada that talked about by format, uh, you know, 91% of clothing, clothing accessory stores were closed. Uh, and that's uh, March slash April numbers and, and continues to linger today. It's starting to open up today. Uh, but by and large, you see uh, you see just dramatic effect, particularly on the fashion and apparel side, uh, but not exclusively. Uh, a little more details. I won't go through this. We'll make the I'll make the presentation available. But uh, basically, as you look through the month of March, this is Statistics Canada data, just kind of scrubbed for all stores and core retail. Uh, you can see these you know these these dramatic shifts. Now this is March. Uh, and March was viewed as pretty catastrophic. Uh, April is going to be. April numbers are going to be more catastrophic. Of course, it's looking in the rearview mirror a little bit. We already know, uh, but April numbers are going to be worse uh, than March. March was down, I think, uh, eight and a half, nine percent. Uh, it's going to be worse in, in April. So March set a record. April is going to set another record, uh, and we're starting to come out of it in May as uh, the curve is flattened in different parts of the country, and, and retailers are starting to open up. Um, and different different people were impacted di in different ways as we adjusted our lives. Uh, to the COVID era. I'm going to talk a lot about that in terms of commodities and what I heard uh, from different merchants and different uh, different formats. So basically, as I said, 8-10% in total decline, uh, largest single decline on record, uh, but we're going to have another record uh, when we look at uh, at April. Uh, re retail e-commerce increased dramatically. You know, circling back to the beginning of the presentation, it was already increasing dramatically. Now, this is where I, I want to put this in because this is the rate that you would read from Stats Canada, 4.8% of total retail trade. Um, so just a commentary in Stats Can data is uh, they do do a good job. We appreciate the direction this, the directional aspect of their data. It, it lacks two things though. It does not report uh, what Canadians buy, it reports what retailers in Canada sell. So there it's missing all the imports that are, that are bought online and, and shipped into Canada. And importantly, the large big players uh, pure play players, uh, Amazon, Wayfair, and their like are not included in the numbers. Stats can consider them a warehouse. Um, no one really knows how big Amazon is exactly. Uh, best estimates are between uh, 12 to 14 to higher, maybe higher now, $16 billion in Canada. Uh, and, you know, in terms of their prime membership, it could be as high as six, between six and seven million. Costco members have six million, so it's not a bad way to index it. Uh, so they're a behemoth, they're not in that number. 
So if you stripped out the number uh, and took all these factors in, our best guess, Retail Council of Canada would have a best guess that we were closer to eight to nine percent of core retail, double that number. And then now, you know, our best guess, and it really is truly a guess, uh, somewhat educated, but it is a guess, is that we're closer to 15 percent today. You know, and, and, and again, a snapshot for March, you can see where the, the one month changes, you know, billions of dollars lost. Uh, and of course, conversely, in the food and beverage stores, a tremendous uh, shift uh, of consumption. And, and it should be mentioned, you know, when you look at some of the numbers, uh, particularly in, in categories like apparel, it would be worse, so to speak, um, if you think about, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that some of these food and beverage stores uh, sell apparel and other merchandise. So um, that's caused a bit of consternation, uh, not exactly a level playing field where some stores are op open because they have food and some stores are closed because they have no food. And of course, the, the stores that are open that are selling food and groceries also sell apparel. So they've been in some ways the beneficiary across the country over the past couple of months. That'll start to smooth out. Uh, but those are monies that are going to be hard to make up. So anyway, lots of statistics, uh, all of which are startling. And um, but you can you can see. The, uh, the the tremendous changes that have happened. And um, Statistics Canada is now doing something that they uh, hadn't done, uh, which is wonderful. They're, they're a great organization, actually. We work uh, with them very carefully. And they're now starting to forecast in the month of April. So typically, Stats Canada data that just came out a couple of weeks ago looks at March. So they're you know a month and a half behind by the time they do their data. And then they're now starting to forecast into and ahead closer to uh, so they're forecasting, as I said, uh, you know, if, if uh, March was bad, April's worse, 15.6% decline uh, in overall retail. Uh, they, they're, they're really just trying to help us as an industry understand what's going on. Uh, there's lots of footprints in the sand of different people trying to understand what's going on, but, but that's a pretty good number. Uh, shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, and again, 15.6%. Uh, and that, that's preliminary, could be higher. And just a quick comment on the United States. Uh, their data is fresher. Uh, they, they're fresher in terms of their data is published more frequently and, and closer to. Um, and April said March was catastrophic in the United States. April was again catastrophic. But interestingly, how when you look at their uh, sales numbers, they dropped in the order of magnitude of what Stats Canada is talking about, uh, which is the 16% and more. Actually, if you look on the right side, the charts kind of parse out core retail and X Auto and different things. Uh, dropped even more. So um, we kind of have some confidence that this 16, 18% number uh, by an order of magnitude is about the right number uh, for the month of, of April. All right, so what's a quote? What what's a snapshot? Um, you know, to sum it all up, in other words, essential retailers continue to be focused on, we're focused on, however that's defined, it depends on where you are, maintain your inventories, get your replenishment going, uh, keep your online sites functional. So much demand crashed many sites. Adapting the, what we're seeing, adapting, adapting hours. Uh, processes are, are huge, different, all kinds of different processes we never imagined having to do before. Um, you know, store associates wearing masks, wearing PPE, uh, hand sanitizer at the door. Uh, for anyone, by the way, listening uh, that is a retailer and looking for kind of a playbook on how to operate their stores, Retail Council Canada has done a wonderful job of putting together playbooks uh, which is, is kind of functional learnings from those who are operating for the past two months, uh, plus best practices around the world. So be sure and check that out. That's on retailcouncil.org. Um, and increasingly dealing with increasingly difficult customers. Uh, and, you know, we're starting to see the mental health issues were always prominent. We're starting to see more of them now. Uh, and so that's not something that uh, you hear often. You may be experiencing it firsthand. Uh, but, you know, the, all of us being locked up is having its... Uh, its effect on in-store behaviors. Um, the good news, bad news, so to speak, the supply chains have been stretched. Uh, they continue to be fragile. I did, uh, if anyone wants to learn more about that uh, on the Voice of Retail podcast, I did an interview with Michael Graydon, president of FCPC, which kind of represents all the, uh, a lot, many of the brands and makers and food and hard goods. And he talked about uh, the, the partnership that, uh, that happened to keep the shelves stocked with retailers, but also that the supply chains remain fragile. Uh, but they still, basically, they held. They were pushed to the brink, uh, but held. And thankfully, the Canadian government did the right thing um, and, and kept the border open. And that was massively helpful, actually, on both sides. But, you know, disruptions can and will happen. What's been going on in the United States for the past week likely will have uh, disruptions on the supply chain. Uh, just the movement of goods, um, it's just less 
you know, is going to be somewhat troublesome, but I, I, I have some confidence. I've got a fair bit of confidence in the supply chain. There may be though out of stocks and styles and issues and difficult getting things, whether that's from China, from Italy, from around the world. Uh, so it's not business as usual, as I like to say, it's business as unusual in all regards, and that includes productivity. You know, for non-essential retailers, and we've seen, you know, liquidity, 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 we've seen the impact on non-essential retailers being closed. Uh, we've had seven or eight uh, retailers uh, go into protection uh, in the past weeks, uh, you know, from Reitman's to Aldo earlier on, and now you've got Sale and you've got the Comark Group uh, who announced and went into protection uh, yesterday. Um, you know, these are, are mall based, largely fashion and apparel. Uh, and, you know, listen, they can't, you know, this, that's a tough business to be in uh, for all the great merchants, but it's a tougher business to be in with uh, without uh, a couple of months of revenue. And then it all depends on how the landlord, uh, your negotiations with the landlord go, because, um, you know, for those who have been told that, you know, even if I'll defer the rent, that's not helpful, uh, you know, making double the rent in, in the fall. It uh, doesn't make up for the fact that there's lost sales in the interim. Um, you know, we're starting to see uh, the government funding is helping. For the, the small, medium-sized enterprise, Main Street retailer, I think there's, you know, they're, they're really adapting e-commerce. And, and for many, e-commerce e wasn't always the best place to invest their time. You know, they're local, had a great uh, relationship with their community. E-commerce was uh, important, but it wasn't as important in some ways for some as others. It's hard to do great customer service and relationship building online. It's now more important than ever. It is a lifeline. Uh, whether that's curbside uh, and the good news is there's lots of platforms where you can get into online and get going quick doesn't make it easy so you have to have the right price and st still consider it like the launch of a new store uh, comment landlord negotiations have been difficult uh, some legislation is being passed at the provincial level to prohibit um, to prohibit um, foreclosures and merchandise seizures and uh, new brunswick for example uh, there's some talk about that in bc Obviously, that would be a very, very helpful. And uh, Retail Council of Canada is probably the biggest file right now is working on uh, what happens with uh, between either landlords on the big side or individuals. Of course, by the time you get to Main Street, you're talking to many, many, many landlords. That's where you need provincial legislation to control that. And Nicole, why don't I stop right now and just see if there's any questions um, just before I continue. Just I, I, again, we're going to leave lots of time at the end for questions. But just in case someone's got um, a question, um, Nicole, anything, anything there? Hi, Michael, this is great information for people. Uh, we do have a question that's come in, uh, wondering what you think, you know, down the road in January, because our audience, of course, um, we, we attend trade shows in both August and January. Our August one is canceled, as everybody knows. Uh, what do you think the retail scene is gonna be for buyers in January? Do you think they're going to be bouncing back by then and looking to place orders? Well, it's a great question, actually. Um, I have been talking to merchants about that exact same thing. So I think in, in the short term, uh, merchants have been worried about, uh, you know, viability, staying alive, uh, getting through, and opening stores. So this is where many, many merchants have been really focused, uh, is just staying, you know, st either staying afloat or opening those stores and serving customers again. Th there's, two, there's two trends uh, that I've been picked up on. On the one hand, Merchants are looking to thin out their assortments, make them simpler, make the assortment simpler. Uh, and that is driven by the need for quick flexibility. In other words, um, you know, as we know, merchants are very good at predicting a year ahead. And by and large, pre-COVID, you know, plus or minus, uh, you could get a sense of where you were going to wind up and what the trends were. Now, um, it, it's, almost, it's almost impossible to predict. So in a world where it's almost impossible to predict, let's stay nimble. Let's put the focus on being nimble. Let's, you know, I give an example. I was talking to a merchant. He says, I've got 10 colorways in a particular product. 80% uh, of the sales are in three of them. I'm just going to bring in the three colorways for now. So the question, what happens in January is the right question, because as we know, right now it's operational and it's uh, streamlining the assortment, maybe even streamlining vendors. But uh, like doesn't change in terms of what people are looking for. They're looking for fresh assortment. They're looking for new things. How merchants will discover those new things uh, is going to change. Um, you know, many are really just trying to get through this year. No travel. In fact, many of them aren't even in their head offices. Will merchants travel in the new year? Uh, I think they'll start to, certainly domestically. 
um, and because and and how they will figure out how to find new product. I think they you know they will need to start uh, their process of cutting purchase orders and and trying to figure things out. Um, so the short answer of a very long answer is is I do think they uh, as a as a industry will start gearing up uh, to find new fresh products and to start buying again. It's a, just a little hard to predict uh, today, but the overri overarching principle I think will stay in place for the next let's call it the COVID era of 24 months, uh, we need to be more nimble. Um, that sometimes means more local, uh, but not always. There's some products just can't be made local. Uh, that sometimes, and local isn't for any other reason than being able to stay nimble. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things going on. Uh, we'll have a better view of it uh, towards the fall as, as, as merchants turn their minds to it. And just picking up on what you've talked about there, um, about retailers staying nimble, uh, we have a question coming in, wondering if you could elaborate on that and put in some practical terms of how they can do so. Well, I, I, I think some of that being nimble is is um, a, a smaller assortment of goods is what I'm hearing from from retailers. Let's let's say I'm going to I'm going to call out my assortment. I'm not going to order as much as I thought. I'm going to uh, I'm going to have fewer vendors with deeper relationships, uh, and then I'm going to uh, you know, not place the orders in the size I used to because I simply don't know what's going to happen. I'll give you an illustration. Many merchants are planning for a second wave in this country. Uh, of course, there's no harm to plan. No one knows it's going to happen, but there's no harm to plan and be ready for it. Um, you know, that could dramatically change uh, change the forecast. And if it's regional, it could change that forecast again. So there's an example where I was talking to a merchant and let's say uh, there's a second wave, uh, but let's say it's not national. Let's say unlike you know, wave one, that the country isn't locked down entirely from coast to coast, but there's a hot spot in a city or a region. Well, I'm going to need my merchandise moved to that region because I'm still operating. So, you know, it, it, that's an example of the dynamism. In other words, get ready to move your merchandise in ways you never did before. Get ready to uh, focus online. Get ready to pull all your marketing. Get ready to increase your marketing. Get ready to, uh, you know, launch new products in ways you hadn't launched before, whether it's flyers direct marketing. And that's some of the nimbleness that um, that we're hearing and I'm hearing from merchants from coast to coast. I'm just going to feed you this one more question before we continue on. And for those that I didn't get to, we will address them at the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. But this kind of jumps off what you're saying there with, um, you know, changing your marketing and, and pivoting to being able to offer your product online. What is the prognosis of a small retailer with no website or Instagram? Well, um, it depends. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, if, if we were talking pre-COVID, I was more optimistic. It, you know, what used to always drive me a little crazy was is when people would say, you know, X percentage of small retailers still don't have a transactional website. Yeah, because for some, it didn't make sense. As I said earlier, you know, being part of your community, knowing your customers, um, having great customer service didn't always translate into online. Now. I think over the next 24 months, uh, we're starting to hit a, a bit of a growth tipping point. And I think consumer behavior is changing in ways we don't yet understand. So when I think about consumer behavior, I think of habits. And we all form habits and people shop in ways um, that they have. For example, they go out for one or two things at a time. That's been dramatically changed right now. And they, they you know, I think it's an opportunity where people are going to be a shopping more online, b going more curbside, and c more open to buying local, uh, more open to buying close to them because they understand. Customer, Canadians understand always have more so lately the fundamental nature and economics of local buying local because those are the people who are hiring their kids, sponsoring their kids' soccer teams, whatever. Retail Council Canada did some research. Uh, last year and asked how important was it to buy Canadian and 85% of Canadians said it was important to buy local and buy Canadian. Now that doesn't mean buy from a Canadian retailer that we weren't making that differentiation but they wanted to buy here in Canada and and literally I think you know it, it's very it's important so make a long story short the good news is there's great platforms out there that you can get into this business quickly I think it's important and the winners so far, not to you know turn back time, as Cher would say, the winners that I've seen in Main Street Retail had already developed 
a, a community on Instagram and social media tied to their e-commerce. It may be a disproportionate, I think at the time it was a disproportionate effort for the return. In other words, you know, it, 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 it was meaningful part of business, but you know, it was probably more effort than it was worth. Now I think that that calculus has changed and it's never too late to start. And um, it's never too late to start any of what that is. If you hadn't done it already, there's probably good reason because it's, it's difficult, time consuming to be a great retailer. Um, so I think it's not too late to start. And uh, for those that are already doing it, my advice is uh, whatever you budgeted to do in 2020 pre-COVID, uh, you haven't budgeted enough. So I do think it's important. So it's definitely going to increase. Yes. Okay, uh, we're going to continue on with the presentation. We'll hold the rest of the questions until the end or near the end anyway. I will remind people right now that there will be a recording of this posted onto our website on cangift.org. Um, I've had that come in a couple times as a question. So if you wanted to review any of this um, fantastic information that Michael is giving today, we will have that available. And back to you, Michael. All right, thanks, Nicole. Well, it's a great segue into this slide, actually. Web customer behavior has been answering the questions. It's the one of the big stories is the acceleration of e-commerce. And again, again, back to the beginning of the presentation, it was already growing uh, and already growing at double digit. And for many, when I talk to retailers, two things happen. Either their, um, their web traffic went up and their sales on their lot website went up commensurately, which meant basically uh, selling to the same people, but just more, their conversions went up. Uh, and for some, their sales grew faster, pointing to a higher degree of conversion or new customers. So at the end of the day, we think, and Stats Canada think, uh, that sales uh, e-commerce went up 16% in the month of March. Uh, I think that's conservative. I think it went up even higher sector by sector. Um, you know, listen, sector and grocery was was phenomenal. We basically got shot through a time tunnel. Uh, grocery, which is one and a half percent, is the kind of poster child for this acceleration. Grocery is one and a half percent, maybe a bit more of sales were done online. It's probably now closer to 15 to 20 percent. And the prediction is that's going to stick. Now, the waterline isn't going to settle at the same rate because all of this was happening when physical stores were closed. And you can see, uh, if you check out like a, a website like BlogTO, you've probably got one in your own community, lineups forming when stores open up, right? And you can see, and, and I'll call out the one interesting example, because it is the counterpoint to do you need e-commerce is the TJ Maxx, Winners, Group, where HomeSense, they have no e-commerce and yet have been thriving in their particular category, value-based retail. And now people are lining up and, and that points to a bunch of things, pent up demand, the cultural importance of shopping, boredom. Uh, so e-commerce, um, you know, we don't, I, I'm careful not to state, overstate e-commerce because as I said, you know, if you do the inverse of the math, um, let's say e-commerce in Canada grows to 15%. So 85% is done in the traditional fashion, right? Influenced by social media, all those other things, vital, uh, but still stores play a, a vital role. And, and the counterpoint, not counterpoint, but the point of that is look at all the pure play digital players that are now and today opening physical stores from Amazon to, uh, you know, Indochino. Uh, all, of these all these people are pure plays that are opening physical stores. Uh, so you'll see lots of movement in that uh, in, in the coming months. Um, the one challenge to e-commerce is, uh, and you saw it from major retailers to small retailers, they were just pounded. With, with volume and crash their sites. You know, one major retailer I can think of, just phenomenal, uh, their site was down for, for days, just crashed. Um, the good news is, from one perspective, it's easy relatively to add server capacity, right? You can get your site ready to take on the increased power. And of course, that's easier still if you're going to a cloud-based platform uh, like a Shopify or Shopify Plus. That's one of the strengths of that platform, right? Is it can take the punishment of sudden increase of sales because, you know, it's in the sky. What can't be changed, what is the constraint for this year and next year is the delivery infrastructure. If you're online today and you're shipping to customers, you know it. You know it's taking longer to get to customers, significantly longer. You know customers are calling you up asking, where is my order? Unfortunately, uh, that is not a short-term fix. Uh, Purolator, for example, had already committed a billion dollars, one billion dollars into building a new warehouse and it's already, it's almost built, but it's already full. Uh, you know, like that shockwave, um, this sudden increase from here to here uh, is just massive. And the system, the delivery system was already 
peaking out a little bit. Uh, we saw that in Black Friday, Cyber Mondays and holiday. Right now, Canada Post, for example, reported last week their single biggest day of package delivery in history in April. Uh, you know, this is not peak. Um, now, again, I think that waterline is going to recede a bit, but just to be clear, a clear constraint is on package delivery. Now, what merchants are thinking is to those that are able, uh, okay, can I do BOPUS, buy online, pick up in store? Can I do um, curbside? Customers, Canadians love curbside. I've done curbside a bunch of times for a bunch of things. Uh, I hadn't done it before. Uh, I love it. Uh, it's great. You pull up, pop the trunk open, uh, pick up the product. And importantly, it is a way to compete against retailers far bigger who have far more resources, still struggling to get that product. You've got the product where you are and you can get it to people in hours, not days. So put that together, triangulate that with constraints on the package infrastructure and the competitive nature. Uh, curbside is a winning formula. Not easy to do. It's expensive to operate, but necessary. Uh, I've already touched on some merchandising stuff and some great questions. Listen, the merchants were just saw just dramatically different buying behaviors. Um, and we heard about them in the media, you know, bread makers up 600%. Uh, and funny, I used to work for Black & Decker during the bread maker era. I never thought I saw that era again. Flour, uh, can't buy it. Uh, you know, it's hard to find, easier now. You know, uh, now uh, talking to merchants, high-end espresso, espresso machines, can't keep them in stock. Why? Because people are going out less. They're, more of us are working at home, still want a delicious coffee. Uh, so I'm just gonna, you know, two days a week maybe didn't make sense to have an espresso machine. Uh, seven days a week makes a little more sense. Um, puzzle, sidewalk chop, work, you know, hair coloring. <laughs> These are all waves that have had and hit. Now outdoor furniture. I just bought a set myself uh, and I went to many sites before I could find anyone that was in stock. So this sudden waves of demand that we're just, uh, you know, back to this flexibility, impossible to predict, um, you know, particularly the bigger tickets you get. Again, merchants looking to streamline their, their assortments to make sure they get their ROI and to be flexible prioritizing nimble adaptation versus depth of assortment. Uh, you probably see that for the next 24 or 36 months. I interviewed Peter Simons from the Maison Simons, president of a great department store. And he and his team, he described to me, you can listen to that episode, he described their strategy is pre-vaccine, post-vaccine. And they, no one knows how all this is gonna wake out, but that's how they're thinking about uh, how they look at these things. Uh, and then, this last point really hits on one of the questions, uh, key question is, is there is concern uh, about how do we do new product discovery? How do we find new product when I can't travel the globe the way I used to, uh, when shows, you know, when, when, you know, how do I get to shows? How do I discover that great new product uh, that's going to wow my customers? Um, so I, emergence are, are, as I said, you know, really focused right now and for the summer on operational issues and now starting to think about these merchandising issues. Uh, as depending on their category kind of rolls through. You know, store operations, I've talked about that at all. You know, pre-COVID, the irony is all we wanted to do was reduce friction. You know, how do we make it easier? Back to the, you know, millennials and Gen Z who wanted, you know, wait, no wait times. I want to tap and go. I want no friction. Now the world is friction, whether it's lines, masks. I, I wish I was a plexiglass manufacturer. Um, you know, all these things, higher operating costs, dramatically higher operating costs and people. So uh, retailers aren't necessarily adding more people, but certainly people have different roles, whether that's greeting at the door, managing customers, administering curbside. I think what you're going to see, particularly in the smaller format stores, and able to adhere to provincial regulations, appointment-based retailing, uh, like a restaurant, you know, like restaurants have reservations, uh, you're going to have a, a scenario where you're going to have to make reservations or stand in line. And maybe that's an opportunity, right? Maybe that's an opportunity to reach out to your best customers uh, if you if you're able and if you know them and say listen um, you know to quote uh, Amex I'm going to put you at the front of the line uh, before anyone comes in would you like to book an appointment uh, safe you know safety is the new table stakes upon which all relationships and trust are built it used to be in the background you know merchants would their stores were clean but they can't keep it in the background now it's in the foreground and that's a dramatic change and and that change will bring on at different levels new tech, uh, both, you know, touchless technology, you see the increase of, of contactless. Um, if you don't have contactless in your store, uh, if you're a small merchant, maybe you didn't want to, uh, you know, absorb those incremental fees. Time to rethink that. Um, you know, I, I'm a little uncomfortable putting that card in. I don't want to touch anything. 
Uh, so it is time to rethink that. Um, it's a higher operating cost, but maybe necessary. It goes into that same calculus. You know, do you take Apple Pay? Um, you know, what do you get from taking Apple Pay? Does it increase your sales? It may, but at some point, it factors in and out of the calculus of what a safe retail environment looks like. I just a couple of comments, and, and I'm not going to kind of dwell on on this slide. Just about you know, I'm going to get into a bit of consumer behavior. You know, where and how people are buying online and in store. You can see the dramatic drops in jewelry the dramatic growth and on dairy. These, these circles are going to move around for the next 18 months. Uh, but anyway, this is one snapshot, Canadian data from McKinsey. Um, and there's some other data from Fusion Analytics based on April. You know, what is it as a modern retailer that you need to get customers? Well, no surprise, Canadians got a value orientation, great sales. You know, great sales, still number one. Number two, great health benefits. I mean, great health measures, that, that didn't exist on any chart like this pre-COVID. Um, I think we should be worried as an industry, we're concerned as an industry with, with the number of retailers going into protection, the amount of product that's going to be sold off on deal. Uh, we can all name eight or 10 retailers uh, that have gone into protection. Some have gone into clearance. You know, the Nygards of the world are, are past protection and they're, they're into clearance. Um, you know, this could have a downward effect on, um, on margins, but it's going to have, you know, the demand's going to be there and, and Canadians still want to see you know, great sales. So um, all these things still count. The, the outlier there that we wouldn't have seen before, great health measures. And similarly, you know, when they go to a store, what do, what do great health measures mean? Um, and you can see number one, they want to see, they want to see visual demonstrations of what you are doing in store to keep them clean. You know, you're spraying the carts. They want to see you wiping down the shelves. Again, that would be in the background before. They want to see all this. They want to see that they have two meter difference. They do not, you know, the level of uncomfortableness is, is huge. And, and you can see all the different ones, you know, gloves not being so important, masks less important. Uh, some, some have them, some don't, kind of in the middle of the road. Um, you know, what, what I, when I talk to merchants, uh, whether their people are wearing them and whether their customers should wear them, there's a couple of merchants in Canada who are asking or saying you must wear a mask. I can think of uh, Longo's Grocery and Costco this week actually just uh, made masks mandatory. They hand them out at the front. Um, I think you, you know, I think masks are going to talk about masks. I think masks are going to be the new headlights. Um, you know, if, for those of you old enough, remember when it was mandatory that you kept your front headlights on to keep people safe. Uh, and a lot of people said, hey, come on, you know, that's my right or seat belts. You know, so masks are the new seat belts. And, a year from today, we're all going to feel strange walking out without a mask on. Um, tourism, just a one quick slide on tourism and some recent developments. Um, you know, listen, the border's closed with America. There's no, uh, there's no, tra there's no, you know, there's no Chinese tourists. The boats have been banned. Uh, big cruise boats have been banned from docking until I think it's now October. Um, you know, this is catastrophic to those who rely on tourist traffic. So the government has recently stepped up and said, listen, all that money that we would spend internationally to get people to come to Canada, we're going to re-swizzle uh, re that money and invest it domestically and get people to travel uh, domestically. Even that will be problematic because there is provincial uh, regulations crossing into the provinces today, uh, but it is not good in the tourism sector. You know, ob observations to date, um, you know, this is kind of basically a summary slide saying, you know, we are all leading different lives now. You work at home, you learn at home, you play at home, you eat at home, um, you know, fashion apparel, you know, to, you know, if you sell leisure wear, you've, you've had good sales. If you're selling formal wear, less so. That will change as we want to appear same, perhaps differently on, on webinars. Um, health and beauty, uh, where we look across the world, health and beauty started to already get to uh, where it was before in different categories, right? In, in hair care, for example, uh, suddenly, uh, hair hair coloring is shot off the charts. Uh, beauty, we're all washing our hands so much more. We need some uh, some treats there. Eye makeup, a little less in cosmetics. Uh, interestingly, eye makeup has risen to be a fast uh, charger. Why? Because it's what you see above the mask. Um, and so we look around the world and we're kind of watching, um, you know, in China, which is not, you know, from a marketplace, it's not always the best to learn from, but you can see some pent up demand. The biggest day in Hermes store 2.7 million in one day in sales pent up demand we're watching i'm watching germany australia much more carefully because uh, it's a similar business environment and see how how those stores open so i talked about you know i talked about the great acceleration 
things that have changed that were already happening. I talked about, you know, department stores sometimes were in the middle. They weren't clear what they were. And you see major department stores in trouble from uh, Neiman Marcus closing 16, none in Canada, fortunately. Uh, Sears is on the brink. They're always on the brink. Um, you know, what's Amazon's next acquisition? Some have said JCPenney. They don't really want JCPenney, in my opinion. They want their stores. They want half their stores. Uh, so uh, maybe you'll see Amazon Prime curbside. Uh, Amazon's, you know, got a bit of a weakness now, right? They've been out, actually outlapped by uh, their big player, their big competitor in the U.S. They've been outlapped by Walmart because they have curbside. Uh, so this is interesting, right? You didn't predict that coming. Big shift to online commerce, experience stores. What does that mean today? Um, you know, trends we observed in China, like live broadcasting. We've talked about social media. You know, we thought that would happen where it's a one-to-one -one live broadcast. Uh, we thought that would come in years. That's going to happen now. It's happening now. Lo more lo online loyalty programs, less printed flyers, but printed flyers still important. Um, and again, I, I think I've said it four or five times, but it, it's worth repeating. Curbside is going to be huge uh, and people are going to love it. And to the degree you can do it, it's a good thing. A um, couple of quick slides, and, and I'm just awareness of time. I want to make sure we, we leave some time for questions. Um, you know, we know that people are watching on social media. So if you're in the marketing space, and again, back to social media, never more important. And these numbers to me were were were, were just amazing because if you think of the growth of social networks up double digit, it's 27% on top of huge growth and a huge base to begin with. Social media use was up. These are raw numbers from from early March. They continue. So if you're going to go online, uh, you know, as I often say, fish where the fish are, the people are online. Uh, so now is a pretty good time to do that. But at the same time, um, there's not much coming in our mailboxes and it's kind of a fun. We're all home. I've talked to merchants who are having great success with direct mail that are revisiting direct mail uh, because uh, there's not much in the mailbox, not very crowded and you can stand out. And um, online ads, again, these charts I'll make available and just really wanted to kind of cover off kind of the marketing piece, keep your customers what, what you should be doing. All right, last three things, and then we'll throw to questions. Um, retailers will consider reconsider their merchandising strategies, basics. Um, you know, how will we think about economics? 2.1 million Canadians unemployed, smaller orders, more focused on the core. Um, Cancelled spring and summer orders altogether. Spring basically didn't happen. Maybe throw it in the warehouse and bring it all out next spring because uh, it didn't happen. Time to consider DTC if you're a brand. Um, if you're not a retailer, but if you're a brand, maybe it is time to go direct to augment uh, what you're doing today. The risk there is you, you could lose your distribution uh, as some merchants uh, close. Some merchants are just closing up and, and they're, you know, they've done a great job building a business, uh, putting their kids through school and, and it's just, you know, they're, they're making some decisions that it may not be, uh, now's the time to go, right? So you're starting to see that. Marketing and promotions, listen, we, we don't know, you know, as much as I've, I've observed and we've talked about, we don't know how this is all going to play out. We're starting to get some sense, uh, but it's a bit of a crystal ball and a bit of a make big bets on strategy versus look at spreadsheets because that's really trying to figure out what is happening. You know, safety, Amazon spending $4 billion to what they call inoculate their supply chain. They think safety is going to be the next thing uh, and they've got the resources to do it. Um, sustainability is taking a backseat today, but it, it will come back. Um, and re retailers will consider what stores look like. And you know, the basics of retail are challenging. There's no playbook. What do associates do? How do we keep people safe? How do we keep employees safe, both physically and now more so mentally? Uh, it's stressful for us all, and uh, whether in store or behind the scenes. Um, how do you measure store now, social distancing? How does that work? How do you run promotions like Black Friday when you have to adhere to the number of people that are in your stores uh, and still get the productivity? Will that shift to Cyber Monday? could shift to Cyber Monday, more emphasis on that, but then you got the package delivery constraints to consider. Um, if it sounds like I'm throwing up a lot more questions and answers, uh, you know, I'm just trying to frame what, 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 we're, uh, what we're talking about. Um, you know, what's keeping retailers up at night? It's a short, you know, it'd be easier to write a list of what's not, but basically paying the rent, the health of their employees, both physical and now more so mental, uh, a second wave. Will that second wave be regional? Will it be national? How hard will it hit? Uh, what's the economy look like in the back half when the government turns off their stimulus taps? Um, you know, what, what happens? And then what the government gives, the tax collector takes away. So $146, $147 billion of consumer stimulus from the government, eventually that's going to need to get paid back. So some concerns that that could be incremental taxes, incremental fees, uh, and whatever that looks like. All right, what's the forecast for 2020? I love this quote by Harry Truman. Give me a one-handed economist uh, who couldn't then say on one hand, on the other hand, um, I asked retailers and they said, well, how big is your dartboard? 
Um, right now, we're just drawing different scenarios. We're not quite sure today as we sit what 2020 looks like. You know, if, if April is down 16%, March, May will probably be better as stores open up. Um, we don't know the short answers. We don't know. It could be down 8 to 10% is the best guess uh, via 2019, but it's really how big is your dartboard. And here's the things at play, right? Um, will there be a wave? What's the economy? Where will office workers be? There's large places in uh, across Canada that rely on office workers shopping uh, and lingering. Uh, will they shop local instead? So there could be transference of that to where they live versus where they work and play. Restaurants and bars, uh, a key driver, sporting events, key driver to retail, a, a close tied infrastructure. Um, again, how do I do Black Friday when I can only fit a few people in, a few people outside in a line? How does that work? Um, and again, to, to last point is, is we're well beyond the maximum package delivery delivery threshold. So how is that all going to play out? All right. So, you know, with that, let's let's leave some time for some questions. Nicole, back to you. OK, I'm back. We have a lot of great questions that have come in. Obviously, everyone wants to pick your mind on subjects you've touched on or they've got a question that's come up uh, thinking about this information that you've provided for everyone. So let's start with this one because um, it's relevant to both of our audiences today, really. How can sales reps and key account managers bring value to independent and national retailers in this new reality? Well, I, I think it's, first of all, the kind of recognition of, of how and ask them how the assortment strategy is going to change. And then some guarantees around uh, how they can serve them best and be nimble. You know, it's back to this flexibility, right? Uh, the other part is, is, you know, how do I get my product in front of you in a safe way? Um, you know, how do I how do I communicate with you and how can I help? And and you know, really for a salesperson for a salesperson, you know, the best salespeople bring a lot of value. They you know, whether it's this presentation or others, try to understand what's going on in the industry um, and and try to understand what happens when. But I do think um, you know, talking to the merchants has never been more important about how they're thinking about their assortment and their plans moving forward because uh, they're thinking about it. They'd like love to hear what you're hearing. You know. Big question from retailers: What are you hearing? You know, what's everybody doing, uh, and how are they approaching it? So uh, I think that's that. Add value. Uh, be ready to be nimble. Uh, be ready for financing that you maybe um, uh, maybe hadn't considered before, uh, and be clear on your channel strategies. I think one thing that's on a lot of retailers' mind, and also in our wholesale audience right now, is your opinion on holiday sales as this is a critical time for holiday connections or, or sorry holiday collections as uh, wholesalers are preparing to ship them out to retailers who are typically used to receiving them um, come July 1st or the be beginning of summer to start merchandising end of summer into fall what's going on with holiday sales well I, I I'm gonna ask the question differently what's going on with back to school it's gonna tell us what's going on for holiday sales um you know, will back to school happen? Will the kids go back to school? That's going to be a kind of an entryway into holiday. I think I think holiday, um, it depends, right? So if we make some bets that there's a, a second wave, but it's um, more regional than national, I think Canada's uh, even reported today, Canada's doing a pretty good job of, of the curve. Uh, does the border stay closed? I think, I think there's risks to any merchant who, uh, or any retailer who relies on tourist traffic um, but I do think that uh, there will be pent up demand. Listen, the counterpoint to that, again, the one arm, the other arm, um, there's discretionary dollars here at play that have never been at play before. What I mean by that is all of us are commuting less. Uh, maybe we're eating out less. We're certainly dining less. Uh, so there's actually cash flow, dis dis you know, disposable income. Uh, so on the one side, you've got a little bit more disposable income. You're filling up your gas tank a little less. Uh, you're traveling perhaps a lot less. You're not doing that vacation that you had had. Um, and there's pent up demand. I mean, when I look at the number of people lining up at the, I was looking at the pictures of the Toronto outlet mall, people lining up, it's not that they desperately needed the clothes, I don't think, that were there. I think they wanted a desperate sense of normality. And if anything comes out of all this, it's it's family and normalcy and gift giving. Uh, so on that hand, I'm, I'm optimistic about holiday sales. Um, on the other hand, I worry about the economy. Uh, let's not lose track that the price of oil uh, has gone to record lows. That has impact not just on our friends uh, in the West and, and on the East, 
uh, consumers in the West and the East, but also has dramatic effects on the government's ability to generate, you know, supporting programs. Uh, and there's 2 million people unemployed right now. Um, right now, you're not really feeling that because there's government stimulus, the SEBA and the different programs. So you're not feeling that today, um, you know, but you're, you might feel that. So those are the two things, you know, listen, I, I, I think merchants are optimistic but careful. And again, that's where it comes to being, to being uh, nimble. But, you know, listen, it's not an easy place to be. Uh, I think many of them are thinking uh, it will return to normal. We'll make up some ground lost. Uh, some sales will never come back. Uh, some sales will come back. Um, just to follow that up quickly, uh, we have a question coming in wondering if you think consumer buying rates will return to normal once a vaccine is available. Um, people are starting to reevaluate stuff in their life now, but are we really just waiting for that vaccine bef before we see a return to normalcy with retail? Uh, well, I guess it, I think we're we're a highly adaptive species. <laughs> we we will adapt. Uh, we're already adapting today, and you know, three things at play. One is we're learning more about this virus, right? We're learning that um, uh, you know masks are helpful. We're learning that proximity is helpful. We're learning being outside is more helpful than being close in. We're learning a lot more than we knew before. Uh, we've got a couple of months with merchants operating in that environment, and we'll have a couple of more. So I think we'll going to adapt, and retailers will adapt uh, to shopping in in the COVID era, let's call it the COVID era. Um, whenever there is a vaccine, things will start to return to normal. Some things will be changed forever. Uh, and for those of you who lived through 9-11, um, you know, some things changed forever. Uh, your behaviors changed forever, consumer behaviors. I never get on an airplane without a fully charged mobile phone, um, for example, you know, this number of years later. Um, so I think some of the things will be changed. Will we be as, as um, uh, as consumerism driven as before, depends how long it lasts, uh, depends on the on the outcome. But I think for sure we will have more emphasis on health and health of the product. And I think our minds will soon turn back to sustainability issues because as we as we think more broadly about uh, the risks to our lives and and people, uh, maybe we'll care more about each other. So I think um, you know behaviors will return. Um, you know, listen, the, the Great Depression changed a lot of things. We go back in history, um, you know, changed how an entire generation thought about money. But the Great Depression was 10 years long, 10 years. Um, so a couple of years, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, you'll see some behaviors that have changed, but they'll kind of, the longer it goes, the more the behaviors change. But I think, I think we'll adapt. Again, I think one of the longest changes, for example, will be we'll, we'll all be wearing masks for a long, long time, maybe the rest of our lives. Uh, going back to something you touched on earlier in the presentation, um, and sort of in, in this mindset of everyone coming together, working together, people wanting examples from other businesses of, of things that are really working, things that are not working, of course, at times, um, this audience member is wondering if you could provide some of those examples of e-commerce working really well and perhaps causing that server crash that you mentioned earlier mm. and um, what examples of e-commerce that are are new um, on the market to online selling that are working well in your opinion uh, let me ask uh, i'll answer the, the second one first and and what i think is working is new and it depends on your audience is this virtual associate this video the fact that social media might have been important before, but it's crucial now. I think that bucket of activity, because so many of us are home. So it gets back to the root of, we're mostly now all at home. Uh, you know, In a different world, I'd be on a stage giving this presentation. We'd be in person. I'd love to see all of you. Uh, but now we're getting used to these virtual things, and I think that's going to stick uh, for a while. So social media, new platforms. Nicole and I were talking about TikTok uh, just before we, we kind of jumped on about how you know it's the new platform for the kids. Uh, but as all social media, there's 4.8 million people, 5 point some million Canadians on TikTok right now. Um, all these social media platforms start young and eventually go through the population. You know, biggest adopters of Facebook now are seniors, right, to be connected. Uh, so I think that's important. In terms of best practices for e-commerce, uh, I think many of the ones that existed before, um, you know, launch a site that, that that's easy. Uh, I'm hearing more and more retailers going to cloud-based platforms so they can adjust to those sales volumes. It's it's never been harder than ever to predict 
sales volumes, traffic volumes. So that augurs towards these cloud-based platforms that can take the punishment and redistribute. And then uh, curbside and pickup will become more important now than ever before. Um, jumping on some of this online technology topic, um, also early in your presentation, you very briefly mentioned artificial intelligence. Uh, could you talk mm. a bit more about how that will affect retail in the near future? Well, I, I you know, I think that there's a couple of ways. One is, is customer facing. You're going to see more chatbots, more pre, you know, when you call up the call centers, you're going to see, and it's already happening. Uh, you're going to see the kind of you go into some AI based chat just to kind of streamline you to a live agent. Uh, so I think you're going to see that. Uh, you're also going to see behind the scenes, the merchants relying more and more on AI to do forecasts because um, the beauty of AI, if you strip it all down, it is a prediction machine and no one needs predictions. You know, right now, the data doesn't work, but it, you know, as we kind of continue through the COVID era, AI will, be, will will just help us understand the spreadsheets and, and understand some volumes. And you're going to see it in machine learning. You're going to see it in contactless identification. You see it, for example, in the airlines uh, in the U.S. starting to run AI-powered facial recognition platforms, so you don't have to take anything physically out. So this this element of not touching anything, whether it's self-checkout, checkout, AI is going to be very powerful uh, and driving a lot of those uh, a lot of those things. And then you know, how merchants, uh, you know, I, I showed that machine learning, machine vision, um, where they're, they're identifying who's in the store and understanding a little bit more about them, even just at a high level, male, female, age, disposition. Uh, and for LP, there is actually a big, uh, a big element of loss prevention um, that, is, that is evolving using AI to do predictions. Um, you know, if you, for example, uh, there's a lot of uh, movement predictions in stores, but if you suddenly see something different happening in a store, in other words, 30 people suddenly run into your store, uh, your cameras are hooked up to AI and, and send that message that an unusual behavior has happened. That takes a lot of computing horsepower. Switching topics, uh, we have a couple questions on the same topic, actually. It's PPE, um, definitely the top of people's minds as they start to reopen their stores right now. Um, so I'm going to roll these couple questions into one. I hope our audience doesn't mind. Um, so just your uh, point of view on the PPE for retailers themselves, um, thinking about smaller retail that has a lot of hand selling. And another audience member has mentioned that they've uh, really gone strong with their PPE with their retail staff, um, having masks, uh, appointments, uh, sanitizer, disinfecting, curbside pickup, all that stuff that's going on right now um, and they've been told that they're very strict with what's what they're offering people so uh what's kind of the line there how far with safety should you go and should your retail staff be in masks you know i i think of ppe and safety like i think of crisis management you can never overreact to a crisis think of um in a different context think of tylenol they had a few 10 people die from 10 bottles that were I guess, going back a while and they removed every single bottle from every single shelf in the world and they recovered from that so i think you know based on the community you serve and the people you serve um i'd start out strict and then work your way back um, and it's got to be where your your people have to be comfortable uh, your associates have to be comfortable have to be comfortable uh, some customers may uh, feel that it's too strict um and you've got to kind of guide i think that that water line will Will change where as people feel comfortable um, but I, I be of the philosophy that you start out more strict than less and work your way back as opposed to more um, more less focused on security and work your way up and you'll you'll just judge that by community and the community of people uh, that you serve some will appreciate it I know I appreciate it now should associates wear masks very difficult on the sales floor if you're apparel uh, to wear a mask but not impossible um, and some, some, you know, sometimes it's it's just difficult to do. Um, uh, but I, I do think it's again start start with it and kind of roll back appointments. I think are going to be necessary uh, and a good thing for many formats. Uh, controlling how many people in the store is going to be both vital and and a legal requirement. Uh, and your customers will appreciate it until they don't. <laughs> That's my short answer. Yeah, and I think a big part of that really is communicating to your customers what you are doing. So they know ahead of time before they show up, like how to expect yeah. 
your staff will look, you know, will they all be in masks? Um, will yeah. there be these extra measures in place? Because people right now are very used to going to their favorite store and seeing it in their favorite state. You know, this is this is a shock to people to come in and see these different measures taking place. So I, I do think communication is really key there as well. Well, Nicole, it's a great point because it's also a reminder of what you'd like to forget that we're in the middle of a, a pandemic, right? And so there's a, you know, when you walk into your favorite store and you see your show associates, you know, wearing PPE and, and it's just another reminder, you you know, you, you go to shop to feel normal again, um, but when you get there, things have changed. So I, I, I think, listen, we're all just getting used to this and, and many stores haven't opened, right? You know, it's only been eight, 10 weeks, let's not forget. Um, but as long as this goes on and, and I have no idea how long this is going to go on, but um, you know, I'm planning uh, the COVID era is at least till 2021, uh, maybe even 2022, uh, but not at this intensity. But I think it'll go. It, there's a great article, "The Hammer and the Dance," right? The hammers, the quarantine, the dance is in and out of quarantine as hotspots uh, come and go, and as we learn more about the nature of where those hotspots are and, and what creates them. Michael, fantastic information. I think everyone really enjoyed this today. We've had so many questions come in. Uh, of course, just a reminder that we are going to have a recording on our website. That's cangift.org. Uh, our last question here is, can you talk about the screen you have up? How can people follow you? Um, where can they find your podcast? What is your Instagram handle? All that fun stuff. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that uh, for that question. Um, and so LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me. You'll find all my handles there. I'm on uh, Twitter. I'm very I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at at Le Voice of Retail, uh, also at, uh, at RCC uh, Michael. Uh, and my podcast, I have three of them now. Actually, I have four of them now. Uh, you know, time on my hands a little bit, not traveling the world. The Voice of Retail podcast is the flagship. I interview. Um, you know, people from around the world. This episode coming up uh, launches every Friday. I'm interviewing the, the the CEO of a retailer in Australia called Bunnings. They're basically a $20 billion retailer in Australia and, and New Zealand. And then I'm interviewing some industry analysts. So always something interesting. You can find that on all major podcast platforms or just access it through my, my LinkedIn. And then I have a website, uh, www.meleblanc.co, where you can also find all that information. If you're into global e-commerce, I have a podcast for that. And if you're in the food business, uh, myself and Dr. Sylvain Shalbra have launched a fun podcast called The Food Professor, where we uh, we talk about those issues. So um, that for me, you know, I'm learning, I, I learned so much from talking to merchants and vendors, and that I've made that into a passion and into the voice of retail, uh, where I interview, you know, just so such interesting people and just ask them the questions you're asking me. Um, how are you feeling? How are you going to buy? And how are you operating? What have you learned? And And so on an ongoing basis, uh, tune in because I, I talked to just some such smart people uh, about uh, what they're going through, and we're all learning, all learning together. Please take the time to follow Michael. I'm just going to second that. He's put his information on the screen right now. Um, it's great to hear what is going on beyond your own business bubble. So if if you didn't realize that Michael is a wealth of knowledge today please tune into his podcast and look him up on uh, the various platforms he's just mentioned uh, because you can truly learn a lot for your business that you can put into practice immediately. And he's super relevant for right now. So thank you for joining us today, Michael. Thank you so much for taking the thank time you. out of your schedule. Uh, we really appreciate this. Uh, we have messages coming in now saying, great presentation. Thank you so much. So happy it's being recorded. I'm going to watch again. So I think people certainly enjoyed hearing your perspective today. And, and Nicole, if there's questions that we haven't uh, got time to answer in this format, just send them to me uh, via email and, and I'll answer them and maybe you can get back to people. So that's another way uh, I'm happy. I uh, don't wanna leave any, any questions unanswered. So that's another way I'd like to offer uh, that they can contact you and you can sum them up and send them to me and I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, that's fantastic. And for those uh, who don't have my email down, it's N for Nicole Hilton, like the hotel, at cangift.org. Michael, thank you again, and uh, we'll see everyone online next time. Thanks so much. Take Thanks, care. everyone. Be safe.